So here we are, uh, David and I are here to talk to you about MS Chap V2, Microsoft Chap V2. Um, you know, Microsoft, the designer of such illustrious protocols as NetBIOS and SIFS, uh, did not stop there. They also gave us an authentication protocol. Uh, and it has two major functions. The first is to provide mutual authentication, and the second is to provide key agreement. So, um, what that means is that a client can authenticate itself to a server uh, as, you know, a client logging into something, uh, but that uh, simultaneously the server authenticates itself to the client. So the, the client knows that the server is really who they're trying to connect to so that no man in the middle attack is possible. Uh, and then key agreement provides, uh, you know, key material so that uh, you can set up an encrypted session moving forward after the handshake is complete. Um, now, this is sort of an archaic protocol. Uh, it was actually uh, published in 1999, but really that was just an update to the older MS Chat V1, which was designed even before that. So this has been around for a while, um, and it's, it's, it's aging. Uh, but it's also strangely pervasive. Uh, you see it in a lot of places, particularly with PPTP VPNs and uh, WPA2 Enterprise uh, connections for the inner authentication for WPA2 Enterprise. Um, and so, you know, we want to look at this protocol so that we can attack uh, these, two, uh, these two points. So the first question is, like, shouldn't we all know better, you know? Shouldn't we all know that this isn't secure? MS Chat V2, PPTP, these kind of things. Uh, the Internet is full of articles like this, right? You know, PPTP uh, uh, authentication proven to be very susceptible to attack. The problem is that all these articles are about dictionary attacks. Right, the idea is that if you get a packet capture for a PPTP VPN connection or a WPA2 wireless uh, inner authentication uh, capture, uh, and you combine it with a tool like a sleep, you've got yourself an offline dictionary attack. Uh, and you can try and guess the, the user's password. Uh, and if uh, you're successful, then you have access to their encrypted traffic as well as uh, their login credentials. Um, there's even a paper that was actually published by Bruce Schneier and Mudge uh, way back in 1999 where they look at this protocol, and um, the, the conclusion of the, the paper is basically, you know, we looked at this, and they fixed most of the problems that we found with MS Chat V1, um, but the real problem here is that uh, the security of the protocol is based on the user's password, uh, and we know that users don't choose good passwords, so, you know, this, this protocol could be susceptible to, to that kind of attack. Um, and so the internet is actually full of questions like these, where you know, people say, well, how secure is PPTP really? You know, is it just a matter of um, choosing a bad, a, a bad password? If, if I were to choose a good passphrase, is the protocol otherwise secure? And you know, usually there's a response like this one that says, yeah, that's the deal. That you know, it's, a, it's a secure protocol if you can manage to choose a secure passphrase. Um, and so you know, I actually think that that's a, a, a reasonable conclusion, you know, given that the given the information that is available. I have a friend who runs a kind of a high-profile VPN service, and he, su supports, he supported PPTP. And, um, and I asked him, so, you know, why did you support PPTP? And he said, well, you know, we looked at the Bruce Schneier analysis, and uh, we concluded that if users, um, you know, that it was just the, the problem with the passwords. And, uh, and so we didn't let our users choose passwords. We had a, a mechanism where we would generate random strings uh, that were the passwords, and we felt that we were secure that way. And, you know, I think that that's a reasonable conclusion given the information that's available. A lot of other people agree. Uh, I put together a list of um, VPN providers that uh, currently support uh, PPTP and MS Chat V2. <laughs> There's actually more than this. I just got tired of typing them in. <laughs> So it's a lot of people. Um, there's even some really high-profile VPN providers, like, uh, like iPredator. This is the Pirate Bay's uh, VPN provider. Uh, and they only support PPTP uh, for their uh, authentication and, and encryption. And you know, presumably, they're, they're uh, trying to protect their traffic from uh, government-level observation, right? Uh, you also see it you know, in WPA2 enterprise setups. It's very common. Uh, for instance, the DEF CON wireless network is using MS Chat V2 as its inner authentication credentials. So, you know, what's the deal? Why, you know, why is this so popular? Well, I feel like there's this, this cycle, right, where it's really widely supported. Uh, it's built into Windows XP. Uh, it's the only, like, VPN authentication method supported in Ubuntu by default out of the box. 
And so it's what people use. You know, it's really widely supported, and so everybody starts using it. And since it's the thing that everybody is using, when people develop new products, that's what they support. And since it's what's really supported everywhere, that's what people end up using. And since that's what everyone's using, that's what people support when they develop new products. It's this really like maddening <laughs> cycle <laughs> that's just impossible to escape from. Uh, just be because just because it's reasonable, I think, to presume that um, you know this is an otherwise secure protocol doesn't mean that it's correct. So let's take a second and look at the internals of, of how this works in this chat B2. So this is the MS chat B2 handshake. You know, you look at it and it's just like, you feel like they're almost trying to like dazzle you into submission. You know, like it's, you know, like, you know, we'll just, it's like the digital version of hand waving. You know, like, if we just hash it again, then, you know. You know, like, crypto analysts will look at this and just, you know, wither, you know, in the. Uh, so let's, let's run through it real fast. All right. Client sends hello. Server sends spike. Sends back a 16 byte random challenge. The client generates its own 16 byte random challenge. Calculates SHA1 of the service challenge, the client's challenge, and the username. Calculates the empty hash of the user's password. And then calculates this thing, the challenge response, by encrypting the challenge hash three different times with three different DES keys, which are different sections of the empty hash of the user's password. Sends back the 24 byte challenge response, the 16 byte challenge hash, and the username, username in the clear, to the server, who then calculates the MD4 of the MD4 of the user's password. Get that? The password hash hash. <laughs> And then calculates SHA1 of the empty hash hash, the challenge response, and the literal string magic server to client signing constant. <laughs> then calculates another SHA1 hash of the previous digest, the challenge hash, and the literal string pad to make it do more than one iteration. <laughs> and then sends that back to the client. You get the feeling that maybe the, the designers didn't know that this was going to be public one day, you know? <laughs> So what's interesting is that if you, if you really look at this, you know, and you get through all the dazzle, you realize that there's actually one, only one unknown in this entire protocol, which is the MD, the MD4 hash of the user's password, right? The NT hash is the only unknown thing here. Everything else, and that, that one unknown is used as the, the three DES keys for uh, the, the encryption of, of the challenge hash. So the one unknown is used in the DES keys that used to encrypt that thing. Everything else is either sent in the clear or can be derived from something sent in the clear. Which means that we can sort of just rip off all this other stuff and only focus on this one core problem here, this one unknown that we're dealing with, right? And so this is where people usually plug in their dictionary attack, right? That they ca do, a, do a packet capture and then they just start doing MD4 hashes of random words and then using that as the three DES keys of the known plain text and see, seeing if it matches the known ciphertext. And if you get a match, then you found the user's password, right? But, you know, I don't think we should be satisfied with that, right? You know, uh, we want 100% success. We don't want to just um, try and guess a user's password because, you know, in, as in the case of the VPN provider that choose random, random passwords on, on behalf of the user, you know, that would not be feasible. Um, so let's look at these DES encryptions here, right? This is really all that's stopping us. Um, now, as a refresher, a DES key is normally eight bytes long, uh, so that's 64 bits of key material, and it should give you a total key space of two to the 64. You know, that's a really big number, a lot of, a lot of keys, right? Somewhere along the way, uh, someone made the dubious decision to turn every eighth bit of a DES key into a parity bit, which means that they're not actually used as part of the, the key material, uh, which means that a, a DES key is actually seven bytes long, uh, that only gives you 56 bits of key material for a total key space of 2 to the 56, which is substantially smaller. Um, so, you know, when we look at our core problem here, we have these three DES encryptions. So that's triple DES, right? The way that triple DES works <laughs> is, uh, you know, triple DES, uh, you know, back when people were starting to lose confidence in, in DES, they would, they would use triple DES in order to secure their communication. The way that works is you have this nested construction where you start in the middle, 
and you uh, encrypt the, you desencrypt the uh, plain text with uh, one key, uh, and then you use the output of that, the ciphertext from the, the middle encryption, uh, as part of a des operation with a second key, and you use the output of that as part of a third des operation with a third key. Uh, so when you do that, you get this multiplicative com complexity, right? Uh, where your key space jumps from 2 to the 56 to 2 to the 56 times 2 to the 56 times 2 to the 56 for a, a total complex, a total key space of 2 to the 168th, which is enormous, right? And in practice, there were some uh, attacks that you could do to reduce that to 2 to the 112th, but that's still uh, quite big and, and certainly sufficient. Um, so. When we go back and we look at our core problem, though, there's no nesting here. This isn't a nested construction. You know, one DES operation has no effect on any other DES operation. They're actually totally independent of each other. Um, you know, it's just encrypting the same plain text three different times with three different keys. So that is not triple DES. That actually gives you an additive complexity, right? Where your key space is 2 to the 56 plus 2 to the 56 plus 2 to the 56, which is 2 to the 57.59. So that's basically the number that we're dealing with here. And that's still kind of a big number. Now, really, we're doing these three DES operations. And so we need three DES keys. Each key is seven bytes long. And so that's a total, total key, key length of 21 bytes. So we need 21 bytes of key material. But remember, what we're using for the keys is the MD4 hash of the user's password. Now, an MD4 hash is only 16 bytes long which means that we have 16 bytes of something, of, of, you know, of, of actual material, and we need 21. So what does Microsoft do? They just pad out the last five bytes with zeros. <laughs> which means that this third key is only two bytes long. It's a 16-bit key that you can brute force that on your laptop in under five seconds. So if we go back and we look, you know, at our total complexity, we've reduced the additive complexity for, to 2 to the 56 plus 2 to the 56 by basically eliminating the third key uh, for, you know, a total number of 2 to the 57th. So now this is what we're dealing with. Um, that's still, you know, a pretty big number. So if we go back and we look at the core problem, we've, we've gotten rid of this, you know, effectively this last uh, desencryption. So we're dealing with these, these two desencryptions here. And, um, you know, that something that's sort of interesting about this is that the plain text is the same in both cases. Uh, that for both DES encryptions, we're encrypting the same thing. So if you think about how you would implement a, a naive sort of brute force attack, uh, what you would do is you would iterate through the entire key space, and for every key in the key space, you would uh, do a DES encryption of your known plain text, and you would see if it matches your first known ciphertext. And if it does, then you know you found the first key. Then you would start over again and iterate through the entire key space again and do a DES encryption of your, for each key in the key space, do a DES encryption of your known plain text and see if it matches your second known ciphertext. Now, the expensive part of this whole brute force operation is this, these DES operations. That's what costs something and, and makes iterating through the key space expensive. But since it's the same plain text both times, you can actually reduce this into a single loop where you iterate through the key space once do a DES operation for every key in the key space, and just do two compares. You compare the output of your DES operation with your first ciphertext and your second ciphertext. Effectively, reducing the total complexity here just down to 2 to the 56th. So if we have a, an MS Chat V2 handshake, we can reduce the entire security of this handshake down to a single DES encryption. So at this point, you know, we thought about it some more, and we were like, all right, can we do, you know, some tricks, whatever, with MD4? And is there anything we can do? And at some point, we were just like, well, fuck it. Let's just call David Holton, uh, <laughs> who <laughs> runs a company called Beacon Computing and uh, knows stuff about brute force and keys. So uh, a while ago, we started looking at DES because uh, part, part of my job at Pico is trying to find archaic algorithms that we can actually, um, actually attack with FPGAs that would normally be out of the reach of, of normal computers. So just looking at DES, um, I pulled these from the Wikipedia page, 
Uh, it's a, a Feistel network cipher, and basically, um, it, back in the day, this was originally developed to run in hardware. You know, this is um, developed to uh, run in ASICs, and um, and so they they really you know developed it as a flowchart. There's lots of bit permutations and lookup tables and and things like that, and um, and so if you if you zoom into this f function, and just look at you know we have like a, this e box is a permutation, s boxes are all just lookup tables, and t box is a permutation. If you look at the p box and zoom in a little bit, um, it's basically just transposing bits inside of uh, uh, you know input bits for output bits. And so uh, if you're trying to do this on a normal computer. Like uh, this is a really uh, horrible implementation of a p-box in software, where basically you know you have a for loop and then it looks it up in a table and like moves bits around and stuff like that. And and you know this is using 32 or 64-bit operations to move bits around. Like it's horribly inefficient. And and sure, there's uh, lots of optimizations that people use nowadays with bit slicing and things like that. But um, but it's really you know trying to do really really simple operations that should be extremely simple on you know something that's made to do all sorts of general purpose operations. Now if you take this problem and look at it actually implemented on an ASIC, you know it's it's essentially free. It's just routing lines. You're just moving bits from one place to another. Um, and so uh, you know why are you using you know billions of gates in order to perform these operations? So one analogy that I like to use for this is that you know, doing it in software is kind of like an octopus riding a tricycle <coughs> versus, you know, a Ferrari or something like that. So, <coughs> so I think uh, in this case, the winner is definitely the ASIC. Uh, people real have realized this for a long time. Um, back in 1999, the EFF built uh, Deep Crack, which was uh, kind of their, uh, they were trying to basically prove that anybody for you know, a small amount of money, uh, in this case it cost them about a quarter million dollars, uh, would be able to break DES in a pretty short amount of time. Uh, in this case, it was about nine days, worst case, with uh, about 1,800 chips total that they made. Uh, they fabbed themselves. And, um, and so, you know, sure, if you have a quarter million dollars you want to spend on this and have a whole team of people that can design the chip and send it out to a fab and all that sort of stuff, that's all fine and great. But for other people, um, there's this, uh, New technology called FPGAs that were invented in the mid '80s, and uh, up until recently, they haven't really found many applications in the general um, sort of supercomputing space. But um, but recently, they're finding their ways into all sorts of different areas. Um, here's just a few that I pulled off of the Wikipedia page: uh, uh, di digital signal processing. They're used in um, and like base stations, like most GSM base stations have some sort of FPGAs in it, so they're software upgradable in the field. And um, software defined radio, uh, because with an FPGA you can basically implement your own ASIC and then program it to the FPGA and update it however many times you want. Um, people just love this, you know, with uh, like the USRP and the GNU Radio Project and stuff like that. Um, and so all sorts of other um, areas. And uh, the one area that I focus on is cryptography. And so kind of the general idea is designing your own chip and uh, making it specifically for breaking a certain algorithm and then programming an FPGA with it. And then you basically have your own custom crypto accelerator that's specifically made for breaking an algorithm. And, um, <clears throat> and then, uh, you know, the, it's kind of the same thing that works for all these different areas of supercomputing. So looking inside an FPGA, uh, the, the bare bones of it is that you have a bunch of lookup tables which can basically describe any sort of arbitrary logic. And so there's your gates, basically. And then um, all you really need is logic and registers, some sort of sense of time that can actually store your data. And then you just need to be able to connect everything together. So they provide LUTs, registers, routing, and then um, they provide a few other things just to make things easier, like a small block RAM, which is a essentially kind of like small pieces of RAM inside the FPGA just because people like to use FIFOs and all sorts of other general purpose storage elements and it makes it a lot more efficient to do it um, that way instead of using up your LUTs. Uh, there's also DSP blocks that implement like adders and multipliers and things like that. And, uh, and DCMs for multiplying clock frequencies and et cetera. But 
the general idea is anything you can describe you know, in a circuit as an ASIC, you can program onto an FPGA and uh, do it you know, programmatically with, with software instead of having to actually fab a chip. So on an FPGA, uh, you probably can't see this too well, but basically describing that S box, you're just making a sign statement and saying, you know, the output of P equals these bits from S. And so there's no, you know, shifting involved. It's all, you can describe it at the bit level or the byte level or how, whatever level you want because it's basically just rerouting signals. So um, you can kind of see how this can make DES a lot more efficient to run on, on a specialized chip. And um, so we went ahead and uh, a while ago we implemented DES just to see how fast we could get it on FPGAs. And uh, this is a picture of a, one of our servers down in the bottom here. It's just a 4U rack mount server. It draws about 2 kilowatts. And um, we went ahead and implemented DES as a real pipeline. So um, on an FPGA, you can actually, you know, each one of those stages of DES, uh, you can actually implement and then have just registers in between them. So as you flow data in, it just gets clocked along through the whole thing. And once the pipeline is full, you get a, an actual DES operation every single clock cycle that you're clocking this. And uh, we can clock this up to, we've clocked it up to 600 megahertz reliably, you know, we're maybe doing 450. And, uh, and so that means for each one of these cores, we're doing 450 million DES operations per second. And each one of the FPGAs can fit 40 cores in it. So that equals about 18 billion keys per second. Then uh, we can fit 48 FPGAs in the server. And so uh, that basically means that we can go through the full 2 to the 56 key space in under 24 hours. <clears throat> and that's worst case time. So in practice, it'll probably be half a day. So if you look at equivalent performance, uh, we just pulled up some benchmarks on CPUs and GPUs. Um, on CPUs, to do it in under 24 hours, it would take, you know, about 80,000 CPU cores, or on GPUs, about 1,800 of them. So just for an idea of scale, you know, 4U machine versus data center full of GPUs or CPUs. <clears throat> so um, the next question that we had is, can we make this faster on an FPGA? And so um, we started looking at this, trying to see if there's any way that we can speed things up a little bit. And, um, and so some, some of the things with implementing this on an FPGA is that we have, you know, certain data that needs to get set in order to set up everything. And so if we're splitting this up across many, many cards, we have to take the whole key space and then split it up into small little sections that each FPGA can crunch on. So we have, uh, you know, like a key start and stop sort of uh, register set up to tell it where to start for each one of the cores. And then we also have to provide the plain text and cipher text that we're looking for. <coughs> And so one optimization that we, that we worked on is um, basically instead of having this whole bus going to each core so we, have, so we set up all these values every time we start up the core, um, we're thinking, well, we could actually take this bit, this bit file that we actually load onto the FPJ with the configuration and pre-configure it with these start, stop, you know, ciphertext, plaintext values. And so we program the FPJ, it comes up, and then it sees all these values there, and it's like, oh, I know exactly where to start. It goes off and starts crunching on things. And so it, we don't have to have all those resources dedicated to just setting everything up. And um, so it turns out that Xilinx actually, uh, which is one of the FPGA manufacturers, provides a method for programming specific block RAMs inside the bit file without having to rebuild the whole thing. And so uh, we played around with this, and we were, were able to get that to work. <clears throat> And basically how it works is, uh, you know, you set up a couple files and then you can just essentially just run a command and it'll drop memory into the bit file and configure these BRAMs and then you program it and everything comes up perfectly good. So the, the second optimization is we still need to have a return path saying when it's found a key or whatever. And so we created a really minimal bus that basically just says, you know, found a key and that's it. And then based on the time that it took to find the key, then because this is all deterministic, we're getting one key per clock cycle, we know with fairly good accuracy exactly where in the key space it was when it found that key. And so, uh, so with these sorts of things, we can reduce quite a bit of the logic and, uh, and get it down to be a lot more optimal. And so this got us about another 20%. <clears throat> 
Uh, and so we're, we're thinking, what else? And this is a, kind of a, a pipe dream that we've think, been thinking about for a while, uh, which we haven't implemented yet. But um, we're planning on releasing a framework sometime in the near future for it. So FPGAs have this thing called JTAG, uh, which if you've done any sort of hardware hacking, you're probably familiar with it, where it's a debug interface that most chips have. And on an FPGA, this is an uh, interface you can use for like programming it. Uh, they also have all sorts of things uh, built in for doing on-chip debugging, where you can basically put like essentially a logic analyzer inside the chip and then you know, tap lines and things like that. And so uh, we found that there's actually a couple commands that they have with, JT with JTAG for uh, letting you read and write to block RAM entirely over JTAG. And so with this, if we do all of our communication with just these little tiny block RAMs inside the FPGA, we don't have to have a bus at all communicating to the outside world. All we have to have is JTAG going to the device, and we don't have to use any routing resources at all to talk to any of the cores. Uh, we can do it all transparently. And so, um, so this is one thing that we're working on, and hopefully this will be working soon. But that could probably get us another 20, 30 percent uh, speed improvement as well. <clears throat> but anyway, uh, regardless, with all of this, it's no fun to crack MS Chap V2 if only we can do it. So, um, after, you know, all these talks that I give, uh, it's always like, oh yeah, you know, you could do this if you get your own FPGA and uh, you know, set it all up and and spend a bunch of money on this, but we decided, why not let you guys do it? <laughs> Hello? Yeah. So, you know, this is one of these things where it's like, um, you know, David's clearly a genius and, you know, he can, you know, crack all this stuff. If there was only some way that we could leverage his genius so that everyone could benefit. Uh, and so uh, we, we put something together where I wrote this tool called Chap Crack. And uh, it's, a, it's a, a simple little tool that uh, you can point at any uh, packet capture and it will parse the entire packet capture and pull out any uh, MS Chap V2 handshakes that exist in the whole capture. In the, the whole capture. And it will uh, give you uh, the things that we're interested in here, you know, like the known plain text and the known cipher text uh, for um, that, that, that core problem that we're dealing with. Uh, and it'll even uh, crack that third key for you, the two byte key. Uh, <laughs> and it tells you, you know, the username of the, the, the person who's logging in in this case, because that's, of course, sent in the clear with MS Chat P2. Uh, and then it gives you this last little thing here, the, uh, a submission token. And so, what is that? Um, so right now we have, right here we have everything that we need, you know, from both parts of this thing except for uh, the key, with the exception of the third key. Uh, and so uh, I have this online service called Cloud Cracker. And uh, it's basically an online password cracker. Um, we support a, a few different formats and you can submit a, a hash of a WPA handshake or, you know, uh, CryptSha 512 or something like that. And uh, we, you know, spin it out across the cloud run a cracking job and mail you your results. Uh, and so what we've done is uh, added a MS Chat V2 option to Cloud Cracker. And so uh, if you have a PP, uh, any kind of MS Chat V2 handshake, you can run uh, Chat Crack over the handshake, get that Cloud Cracker submission token, and paste it into the website here. Uh, once you do that, you just uh, uh, submit the job with your email address. And uh, David has been kind enough to put uh, his FPGA cracking magic online, and it uh, transparently sends that over there, uh, runs the job, and you get your results back in less than a day. Which means that anybody should now have the ability to crack MS Chapter 2. <laughs> We're hoping that by doing this, uh, we can break out of this like <laughs> fucking uh, cycle of. Uh, of uh, of uh, support and use, uh, but in the meantime, have some fun with it. Uh, so thanks for listening, and uh, let's all give a round of applause for uh, Marsh Ray, who couldn't be here today, but was uh, instrumental in a lot of this stuff as well. <laughs> <laughs>